today we're going to be mixing the video up between playing two tables and studying, playing, studying. And by studying, what I really mean is, is talking, discussing, um, thinking about some of the issues that can lead to us underperforming at the poker tables and, and what really separates the the win rates of some highly skilled players from other highly skilled players. There are there's quite a lot of phenomena in this game um, that I've observed in students where whereby a guy with more potential than someone else with more skill, with more intellectual understanding and capacity for learning the game can perform far worse win rate wise, drafts wise, results wise than a weaker player. It's not what you know in this game that determines how well you do. It's what you do. It's what you button. It's the buttons you click at the table. I know you guys are restless. You want to see some cards in the air, don't you? So let's do that. Play a hand. I'm going to focus on solid play today. Not going to be doing anything too unconventional today or weird. I'm just going to be playing as solidly as I can and talking about a bit about performance when I'm playing. So I'm going to be trying to access my best possible thought process that I can and just play the hand in the way that I think is best. So hopefully we'll get into a spot relatively quickly because I, I have five points to go through in the theoretical part of this video. I actually have five topics to discuss. So with any luck, we'll get some interesting spots to, to fill in the gaps here. So facing a cold call here with pocket jacks. If we face big blind squeeze, which we do, um, this is going to be, I believe, a pure call. I don't, I don't think that there will be any um, for betting in these positions, especially with big blind having a bit of a more polarized range. Ten seven, I think, is is borderline, but I think we can probably peel to two point five x blind versus blind, but not to three. So ten nine eight is. Is a flop that is very good for my range and I'll want to be betting very frequently here. I think the easiest simplified strategy to play here is to use small bets. And I think this hand will bet more often than my global bet frequency, which will be quite high, it'll be like 60, but I think this hand can bet about 80% of the time. And I'm going to use the sizing. What the sizing really facilitates is just that when I'm betting some of the one pair of hands in my range, like jacks or hybrids like sevens that have quite a lot of equity but benefit from fold equity as well um that i'm going to be doing pretty well i think i think one thing that can happen here is that people can fail to jam enough or raise enough on the flop here turn is an interesting spot at this point in the hand i will start polarizing my strategy and betting bigger i think with the spade in my hand here and these two jacks i think check is fine we're not vulnerable to a queen or seven here, just really to an ace or a king. And that's not in and of itself enough reason to to want to necessarily bet this node. I think betting this node is, is also okay. Being facing the check raise with jacks on that node is, is somewhat better, I think, when you don't have the jack of spades because you run into bluffs a bit more frequently. Now this can be this can be a lot of different things. I think call is too good here to consider doing anything else. I think we can win against hands like ace 10, king 10 that are blocking, and we can also, we will lose to over pairs quite a lot here, but I think we'll also win against 10 plus. So, very easy call. Villain shows king queen. And yeah, I think that hand is, is fairly okay by both parties. I think you could be raising flops sometimes there. And I don't think it's too abnormal how we played the hand. Um, but quickly just see if I can talk about it in the replay. So now we've converted into um, chips rather than big blinds here. So just pay attention to that. So I want I want a fairly high bet frequency with range. And the way I generally think about poker is that my hand wants to bet either globally the same as my range or more often or less often than range. And I think here, this hand benefiting from fold equity, having a lot of equity, and having some nut potential to play bigger pots as well is, is going to be betting more often than global. I don't think it's a mistake to check this hand if I didn't roll low enough to check. I use a small sizing here because in position at this SBR, I don't have to rush pot growth. 
and villains range is quite cut and dry between sort of over cards that don't have very much and pairs and sets that do. Over pairs and sets that do. He won't have a, a merged hand like sixes or something very often, right? So he has a more polar range, so we want to bet smaller generally against more polar range on the five turn. I think betting is is okay here. It's a bit awkward in that if villain shoves on this node, I actually don't think I'm doing very well against pool. I'm sure solver will will bet here sometimes and call. If raised, it will just bet call. I think if I don't have a spade, that makes a bit more sense as I incur more shove from king jack of spades, queen jack of not queen jack of straight ace jack of spades, ace queen of spades, ace king of spades. I think with the spade here, I like checking back against humans. I didn't roll this one. The reason I didn't roll this one was I can see flop not being raised enough um, with pairs just because of the look of the texture against humans per se. So I think in real life here, theoretically, I, I'm sure there's no theoretical EV loss from, from betting this turn. In practice, I think there might be. And on the river, I don't think we, we ever have a race here. I don't think we ever have a fold here. And interesting to note, villain chooses this sizing. It's interesting because I think over pairs can probably consider betting a bit bigger than this. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, it, maybe there's some hands that can do this, like 10x, etc. I guess the sizing makes sense. Like it would be one of the options. If you're bluffing this size, you need to be a bit careful that you're not over bluffing this size. It's very easy to over bluff this size because of the, the value bluff ratio that's required of such a small bet. Um, so you'd have to be kind of rolling. You're going to have flushes here. You're going to have boats. You're going to have um, maybe boats, maybe not. You're going to have over pairs. You're going to have bigger sizes as well. So yeah, probably this is this is fine with all sorts of like one pair. Um, does make a lot of sense actually. I think on the Diamond River, maybe maybe it's good. So anyway, um, I think the hand was played played fine, um, objectively by both parties. But it's interesting that that I think turn maybe performs a bit worse, um, in reality than it does in equilibrium. I could be wrong about that, but I, I just suspect that betting turn is at that SBR with this hand is kind of dicey actually. Um, anyway, so there are five areas where I think people underperform. There are more than five, but I've chosen five for the purposes of today's video. The first one is fear and anxiety. So whenever these two emotions, and I think anger is also on the spectrum as well, I think basically fear and discomfort that come from kind of thinking a bad thing might happen to you, that you're not secure, not okay, basically lead to, to fear, anxiety, and anger. Like I think that fear is the trigger and anxiety and anger are two not totally unrelated, but like semi-unrelated ways of expressing that, that that uncomfortable emotion. If you think about when people are angry in general, they're generally not okay. They're feeling like they need to protect themselves, protective instinct, right? When someone's nasty and angry and horrible and shouts at you, they're feeling threatened generally. They're not doing that because they just love shouting at people. So yeah, at the poker table, you can feel angry, um, which can cause you to go into a fight tilt. You can feel afraid which can cause you to enter a flight tilt. I talk about all of this in my book, Poker Therapy, available on Run at Once. Um, and we also might just have a, a more subtle kind of underlying anxiety issue at the tables where every time we're in a hand, we just feel uneasy and we make different button clicks than we ought to, than we've practiced or trained making because we effectively feel a discomfort with an investment line. Or maybe even with a fold. Sometimes you can fear folding, right? You can fear being run over. And that, that, go, that goes into anger. With some people and others, you can just feel like anxious about, about folding. So fear and anxiety, I think you really, the first thing to do here is really ask yourself, like how much are these two sort of related concepts affecting you when you play? And be really objective about it and really honest. For example, when I was on the turn there with Jax, I experienced anxiety, not majorly. But enough that it registered on my radar that I was like, I feel slightly uneasy here. And I, then my job was to work out whether, and I felt uneasy about the line bet. And my job was to try and figure out whether I just felt uneasy because if I face jam, it'll be, it'll be a bad branch or whether that branch is actually too frequent and too bad for bet to go ahead and try and yield the benefits it's trying to yield. So, and I think it was actually mostly justified there i think actually that spot is one that i shouldn't feel great about about betting um however 
I also think that it could easily have been the other way where that was just based on the discomfort of dreading a certain line, dreading a certain action by you or your opponent. So just I, I just say to yourself on this one, next time you're in a session, try to really step back and ask yourself, to what extent have I been play for 20 minutes, then sit out and ask yourself, to what extent have I been afraid or anxious during the session or angry or pissed off or whatever you want to say? And then try and trace the source of it. Like, where did that come from? Why did I feel when that reg three bet me, why did I feel like a fight tilt response? I wanted to attack him. I wanted to four bet. I wanted to not fold a hand that I should have folded on the flop or whatever. Usually it comes from an insecurity and that insecurity usually manifests uh, a state of affairs in the future that you don't want to happen. And what you should then do is say, well, what is that state of affairs I don't want to happen for me? It was facing a turn jam. And what does it really mean if that happens? Is there a way I can actually be okay with that? So if you're feeling afraid about playing against a renowned strong player in your pool, ask yourself, what is the state of affairs that I'm dreading? It's actually being bested by that player, being sort of embarrassed, humiliated, beaten, having your money taken. And then ask yourself in the grand scheme of things, can that guy control my win rate in the pool? Can this one player, you know, control my fate? Obviously not, right? You only play a smidgen of hands against this guy. So you can sort of just do your best against him and then get on with the rest of your life. It's just one example of of how to rationalize fear and anxiety. So basically what we're going to do is try and trace the root cause. What's the state of affairs that this emotion is trying to make you aware of so you can avoid it? And then should you really be avoiding that state of affairs or should you be embracing it and actually just moving on with your life and and banishing this, this underperformance leak? Okay, let's play a little bit more, shall we? four more of these to get through so i will just be stopping at pretty much every hand that comes up i won't be waiting for some very big pot or very exciting action or anything like that i don't think those are necessarily the most beneficial things for your win rate anyway so yeah fear and anxiety i'll also talk a little bit more while i'm waiting for spots on the thing i've just discussed and um, this can come up in in so, so many ways, major and minor, in so many spots. For example, when I see Chips and Crisps, I recognize this name as being like, I think a strong player, I don't really know. And it's like 1% of my brain goes, oh, I hope he doesn't open. It's not strong. It's just like 1% of my brain. So the point here is that fear and anxiety can exist in very minor ways that still have an impact. You know, if on a very regular basis, you are suffering from fear and anxiety. Um, this is not technically a three bet. I'm just going to three bet. So we have a hand to play. I think this is like, it's kind of a little bit, it's probably a little bit losing. I don't think it's like majorly losing to the point that I care. I mean, this is theoretically and in, in real life, it may not be losing. See, I won the pot. It was good. Um, That's another thing. <laughs> Results orientation. Another, um, it's not actually in this video, but it's definitely another thing. Um, Ace eight specifically, I don't think in these positions does any four bet. Also, I'm terrified of this player. Remember, 1% of me is terrified of this player based on fear and anxiety. And there's lots of other things that can be, it can be out of game as well. You can have a fear of studying, which can be based on not wanting to invest effort to then not make it. Don't try, can't fail sort of mentality. You can have a fear of um, losing. So you don't play poker at all and you just study, 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 which doesn't make you any money and it doesn't actually help you become a better button clicker. Being a good button clicker is a very important part of your win rate, not just knowing things, but being able to click the right button at the right time. You can have a fear of not playing because you just feel like you must always make money. You can have it the other way around. You can have a fear or an anxiety about anything. It really just is a catch-all term for negative emotions that try to make you aware of possible states of future affairs that may be perceived to be bad for you by some part of the subconscious. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about anything that is necessarily bad for you. We're just talking about something that might be. I will be taking every slightly losing spot in this video pre-flop, just so you know, to try and speed it up. That's for you guys. I'm taking that hit for you. 
so yeah, lots of other things planned this year for Run It Once. I am excited to be bringing you guys another year of content in, in 2022. Happy to be to be here at Run It Once again. We have a post up hand finally. We're going to flat here. I'm going to have something to do here, which is nice. Um, and on King Six Seven, I'm going to play. I'm going to play a small bet strategy on the swap. I could play a big bet strategy as well. I'm going to bet the hand with the nine of clubs a lot more than global. Global will be about. 45%, I think. That's what I'm guessing here. We'll 70 with this hand. I rolled high, very high, so we'll check. But usually betting. King does a good four bet. Um, I'm going to just focus on the left hand table, though. I don't care about mixing pre in this situation. Um, when Villain over bets here, I, th I think this hand is just too good to fold. This is, a, this is a good sizing. I don't think I need any raise now. I do cap my range when I check back. I think this is a pure call. Although we need, you know, mathematically it's quite funny, right? Because we need um, 36%, 37% or something to call this bet. No, 35 36% to call this bet. And clearly we don't have that. Um, but what we do have is lots of implied odds and position and the ability to bluff in very favorable worlds. Like, for example, a villain checks here. This bet that I'm about to make, and I'm going to roll between a big size and an over bet here. Over bet as I would with a flush. So, this bet I'm about to make here. I'm just going to use this sizing in this spot because of my, my range is kind of deficient in votes. So, I'm not going to go like 2x pot, but I'm going to use this one. Um, so, this bet I'm about to make is very profitable. It's not just a break even bluff um, in that action sequence where my opponent bets turn, polarizes heavily, and then checks river. The fold equity compared with that of the math, the mathematical sort of norm, the, the equilibrium fold equity is very, very high. And that's because the polarized range is not incentivized to slow play on a node where he's just polarized, right? So basically, he's overfolding that node dramatically compared to the math. And um, I'm not saying that the player is overfolding exploitatively. There's two types of overfolding, mathematical and exploitative. So, so, so this hand is just a mathematical overfold by my opponent. But one of the reasons that you, it may seem obvious to call 8-9 there, but one of the reasons why we call 8-9 on the turn is that when we don't get there and Villain checks the river, especially on a card that's fantastic for a range like a queen and terrible for his, um, you're going to be yielding like 75% fold equity, 80% fold equity with a bet like that that is clearly breaking even if it gets um, slightly more than 50%. So yeah, it's, it's very worthwhile understanding that position gives you the right to make that river bet if you didn't have position you end up not being able to bet the river and then the EV of the, the turn call is losing. So being in position on the turn is is kind of the be-all and end-all of how profitable the spot will go for you. It improves your implied, implied odds and it improves your, your future fold equity and ability to bet. The next thing that I think is an issue for people in-game is rigidity. People are like students. My students are okay with this usually because I just beat it out of them. But I've definitely experienced them um, this phenomenon a lot of times where there's somebody who learns GTO, let's say, start studying solvers and they get lost down this rabbit hole of imitation. They're trying to copy strategies perfectly. They're trying to play maybe more sizes than would be best for them. I'm not saying that everybody should always simplify as much as they can. Some people can pull off, you know, more complex strategies, but I see a lot of learners, you know, in poker, intermediate players, beginning players, trying to copy solvers, trying to always do X, like obsessing over the frequency of like their preflop three bet with a certain bluff instead of just like mixing it and getting on with life and and you know focusing on what's important maybe like not deviating in spots where it's just obvious that population is going to be playing in a different way or maybe not asking questions about where they should deviate basically not being able to think for yourself not being able to explore options being stuck in a very rigid paradigm and even like the danger here is like misapplying things that you've learned and like because you're so rigid you're just trying to recall kind of arbitrary things that you've misremembered and don't really understand instead of adapting to every situation and noticing that he just snap check called the turn and flop and as a crazy fish that's running 60 34 probably don't want to bluff the river against the sky right ever unless it's one of these really favorable spots but a triple barrel there is just always going to be bad on most textures so, so yeah, when you're too rigid, poker becomes dry, it becomes stale, boring, 
it becomes like a science and poker is not a science it's actually a creative endeavor um and there's lots of different ways you can play a spot it's a very fun game in that you have this endless toolkit available to you you can sort of use sizing you can use your own range in a way where you can come up with like fun things to do and you can raise someone when you think their timing means that they're more capped with a hand that isn't always meant to raise. You can just pure raise it. You know, you do things like that. And when you get in touch with what real life EV is, which is actually making more money at the tables than your preparation or studies could could actually achieve based on some in-game factor, you, you're just freed from this prison of of just obsessing over the data you've studied and trying to replicate study sessions in game is a different beast you shouldn't be trying to replicate your studies in game you should be trying to use the skills your studies have given you to make as much money as you can don't be too rigid you'll suck the life out of the game for yourself you won't be actually improving your in-game ev and you'll be underperforming massively the number of students who are very clever very logical very hard working can grasp theory very well but just cannot apply it is overwhelming. It's by far probably the most common reason that people you know quit before they reach their goals or underperform for for a long time as a professional or semi-professional poker player.